notice. On the 8th of June, the British aircraft carrier HMS Glorious and her two escorts were surprised by two German battleships coming from Norway. In the battle that followed, all three British ships were sunk. 1,500 lives were lost. Only 39 British sailors survived. From then on, the name Hinsley attached to any document was given top priority. Station X's credibility was growing. In 1940, the codebreakers had their first breakthrough. The German operators were making a tiny error in the way they were setting up their machines. It was known as the double indicator. It was to be the Enigma's Achilles heel. The instruction sheets for each day had told the German operator how to set up his Enigma. The rotors and the ring of letters around each rotor were put into their given positions. The sheets then specified how the plug board should be wired up. All Enigmas on a network had to be set up identically for the system to work. But there was more, one extra level of security. If the enemy captured the instruction sheets, they would be able to read all the messages. To prevent this, each and every message had its own secret rotor setting, chosen by the operator himself. To do this, the operator first turned the rotors to three letters chosen at random. These would be sent by Morse to the operator at the other end in plain text, so that he could line up his machine similarly. But now the operator had to be able to tell the operator at the receiving end what the actual message settings from which, they were going to, from which he was going to start enciphering the message. And that had to be conveyed to the operator at the other end, but not revealed to any interceptor. And the way that they chose to do this was to use the Enigma machine itself to conceal this message setting. The operator encodes a second group of three letters as the secret message setting itself. And supposing he thought of SWJ. And when he keys in SWJ, the lamps light up ITB. Because the Germans felt that radio transmissions might be unreliable, they went a step further and they actually asked the operator at the sending end to key in the message setting twice. So the procedure was to key in SWJ, SWJ, and to note down all six lamps that lit. And that was a crucial mistake, because the repetition of the message setting gives a cryptographer a toehold into finding out what it actually is. Repetitions are always bad news in cryptography. By encoding the same letters twice, the Germans were giving the code breakers their first clue as to how the rotors were set on the Enigma. Soon there was a second clue. Station X noticed a strange quirk in the way the rotors worked. In about one out of eight intercepts, the Enigma was turning one of the letters in the message setting into the same coded letter twice. This repeat should never have happened. The mistake of sending the message setting twice was revealing a flaw in the machine itself. Although it was designed to produce random coded letters, there were certain situations in which the Enigma was much less random than the Germans would have hoped. There is no such thing as a random, a truly random sequence that can be generated by a purely deterministic machine uh, that just cannot be. Uh, it's part of the definition of randomness that it cannot be explained or predicted in any way whatsoever. The whole game of cipher design is to design machines which 
are flawed, they have to be, but in which the flaws are as small, inconspicuous as possible. It was just such a flaw that finally broke the enigma. Station X called the repeated letters females. There could only be a few configurations that could produce these females. If the code breakers now worked their way through them, they would find that day's settings. The code breakers produced huge cards, known as Jeffrey's sheets, with holes punched through in an alphabetical grid, representing the wheel positions that could produce females. By lining the sheets over each other, Station X could hunt through the wheel positions to find out how the Enigma had been set up for that day. They were... John Jeffreys, they were really his rather special baby. And they were on sort of cartridge weight paper, not very thick card, they got very dog-eared. And as far as I remember, there were two alphabets, that way and that way. It was like solving a very difficult crossword puzzle. You could actually see it happening. And the triumph when you found it worked, that was fascinating. Marvellous, absolutely marvellous. There's nothing like seeing a code broken. <laughs> that is really absolutely the tops. The one thing that was very interesting was that people were very reluctant to go home at the end of the shift. There was a certain amount of move over, you know, that let me sit down and get on with it. People wanted to hang in there. On one occasion, I was on the evening shift, but when midnight came, I was stuck in a message that was had gripped me so hard, I worked right through till breakfast time, from four o'clock in the afternoon till breakfast the next day, simply because this had to get done. In the spring of 1941, the naval war was building up in the Mediterranean. Hitler had joined forces with the Italian fascist Mussolini. Both dictators were dreaming of new world empires. The code breakers knew that the Germans had given the Italians Enigma machines to encode their communications. A 19-year-old girl was trying to break into the Italian messages. Sometimes you'd have to spend the whole night assuming every position that there could be on the three different wheels. And uh, there we call them red, blue and green, the wheels. I think they did too. So that you, you would have to work at it very, very hard. And it was that, I think, that made one pink-eyed and one, after you'd done it for a few hours, you wondered you know, whether you'd ever see anything when it was before your eyes because you were so snarled up in it all. Mavis and the other code breakers didn't know it, but they were about to make their first major impact on the war. The one that came up was real good stuff, drama. Today's the day minus three, just that, nothing else. And so, of course, we knew that something was going to happen. The Italians were going to do something in the Italian Navy in three days' time. Why they had to say that, I can't imagine. It seemed rather daft, but still, they did. 